of 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the rights of God in him. And when Christ died in Calvary's cross, he became, became sin for us. That is, he bore our sins in his own body. And when God judged sin on this earth, he judgment Calvary. When Christ died at Calvary, uh, John the Baptist speaks of it and says, uh, Behold the Lamb of God that uh, taketh away the sin of the world. When Christ died in Calvary's cross, he bore your sins in his own body and became sin in your place, that you might become the rights of God in him. That's the first judgment. The first judgment is the poured out wrath of God against sin by pouring out his wrath upon his Son, who became sin for us. Now, we call that in the Bible imputation. That's the Bible word. Uh, imputation means that God charges something to somebody. For example, the Bible says, uh, Sin is not imputed where there is no law. David in the Old Testament said, Blessed is the man to whom the law will not impute sin. What does that mean? That means, Blessed the man to whom God will not, to whom God will not charge sin, to impute it, to charge you up to his account. Now, if you want to mess up a Catholic priest, I can tell you how to do it without being anti Catholic. That's for the benefit of these, uh, the boob tube viewers. <laughs> Uh, I say, I do not be anti Catholic. The way to do it is simply ask your whatever his name is, or daddy, buddy, whatever his name is. Uh, sit him down and ask him to talk to you about imputation. You know why? No Catholic priest in the world understands imputation. No archbishop understands imputation. Any man who thinks you can lose your salvation cannot tell you what imputation means. And yet the Bible says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Well, it's not such an important thing. How do you explain the fact that I've never lived a pope who could explain it? Pope John Paul II, if he could stand this pulpit tonight, couldn't open his mouth about imputation. He doesn't know what it means. The Bible doctrine. As a matter of fact, you have to be saved to know what it, what it means. And if you're not saved, you can't even guess what it means. Imputation. I'm going to illustrate imputation in a minute. And when I illustrate it, some of you aren't going to believe it. You're not going to believe it because you don't know anything about it. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord not impute sin. Do you realize that I get myself in a position where although I sin, my sin is not charged to me? You say, oh, I don't know about that. That's your problem. That's your problem. So you know nothing about it. Now, I'll show you what imputation is. I'll show you my new Catholic priest, a Campbellite elder. Elder has any idea about it. Now, get your water, though. Get your Campbellite. Or get your charismatic. I mean, one of just as stupid as the other when it comes to these matters. Now, see this thing right here? This is a record of the life of Jesus Christ. This is the record of life of a, of a sinless, perfect man that never sinned in his life. This is the diary of Peter S. Ruckman, 71 year diary. <laughs> and errors, mistakes, transgressions, and sin, filth, wickedness, godliness, depravity, busting every law in the book. There's the life of Peter S. Ruckman. There's the life of Jesus Christ. And when I trust Christ my Savior, God Almighty takes this book of this perfect man and writes across it, this is the diary of Peter S. Whitman. And he does that, God imputes his righteousness to me. And there isn't a priest in the world that knows anything about that at all. That's imputed righteousness. Then God takes this book with all this wickedness in it and writes across it, this is the life of my son, Jesus Christ. And God takes my sins and imputes them to him. And that's where some of you slipped off the bench, right there. You know why you did? Because you know nothing about imputation. Imputation is God takes my sins and marks them down on his son's record. And God takes his son's righteousness and marks it down on my record. Hallelujah, I'm free. No Catholic priest understands that. No Catholic nun understands that. Mother Teresa wouldn't know what to say about it. All right, Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. And the third day he rose again from the dead. Listen, if you believe that, you know works can't save you. Listen, if you believe that, you don't believe that works can even have a part in your salvation. All right, Christ died for your sin, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and the third day he rose again from the dead, according to the Scriptures. That terrible, dark, and lonely day when the Son of God became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the rights of God in him, God, God put out his unseen wrath on the, on the body and soul and spirit of a helpless man, a righteous, innocent victim. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For what is written? Curse is that one that hangs on the tree. Jesus Christ bore the unseen wrath of God in his bosom for sinners. When he died in Calvary's cross, uh, God gave him the cup of fury. At the hand of the Lord, he drank the cup, and drank the cup of fury at the Lord's hand. So God's wrath fell on Jesus Christ, and that's when sin was judged. Every sin ever committed by man, now, in the past, in the future, is taken care of at Calvary. And if you want to get freedom from the judgment against sins, you've got to come to Calvary. I'll make it as simple as I can. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. That's all there is to it. It's so simple. Men make it so hard. Preachers make it so difficult. I don't know why. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. Can I get any more plain with you? You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You say, what? I don't care. You want to go to hell? Trust good enough. You want to go to hell? Trust your mother. You want to go to hell? Trust the church. You want to go to hell? Trust the sacraments. You want to go to hell? Trust anything. Buddhism, that's a good way to hell. Hinduism, that's another good way to hell. Mohammedism, Catholicism, Protestant. What road to hell is good enough? <laughs> you want to be safe? Go to Calvary. You want to go to hell? Pick your weapons. Damnation comes every size you can get. 
Uh, if you want to go to hell, don't take you there. Liquor take you there. Drugs will take you there. Fornication will take you there. Drugs will take you there. The church will take you there. The priest will take you there. The priest will take you there. The bishop will take you there. The sacrament will take you there. Baptism will take you there. The Lord's Supper will take you there. You can stay. Just, just take whatever way you want to go to hell. You want to go to hell. There's many ways to go to hell without people. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. All right, now, take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. You say, well, what if a person receives Jesus Christ? Let me do this. We're not talking about that yet. We're talking about getting to heaven. You said, you do tell me if man trusts Jesus Christ and then goes out and kills somebody, then we're not talking about that. We're talking about going to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, trust Christ. You want to go to hell, trust something else. You say, but what if? Yeah, but we'll talk about that over here. You see, you've got a right to divide the word of truth. All right, now, man, trust Jesus Christ. What happens? He's saved. That fixes him for eternity. When you trust Christ as a Savior, that fixes things for eternity. Now, it doesn't fix everything in time. And one of the saddest things you learn when you get saved is getting saved may solve all your problems for eternity, but it doesn't solve all your problems now. I don't think you find out. Now, a person receives Jesus Christ, what happens to him? Then the Bible says he's been born again. Being born again of incorruptible seed by the word of God, but liveth and abideth forever. When a man gets saved, he's born of incorruptible seed. What happens to him? He becomes God's child. The Bible says you not receive the, the spirit of, uh, of, of, uh, of fear, but receive the spirit of adoption. For why we cry, Abba, Father. And if you receive that spirit, you're no longer a servant, but you're a son. You're a child of God. As many as received him, but then they gave power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name, which were born... Not of the flesh, nor the will of man, nor the will, uh, will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of the Spirit. When a man is born again, he becomes God's child, he's born again. This means you're a son. Uh, until a man's born again, that Bible says you're all children of God, what? Automatically? No. You're all children of God by what? By faith in Jesus Christ. And if you've ever seen Christ your Savior, you're not a child of God. Now, you become a son of God. How long will you be a son of God? Well, how long will you be a son of the Father? If you're born of incorruptible seed, if you're born of your father's seed, no matter what happens to your name your, or your death or your life, you're still from your father. You can't be unborn again. You can't change your seed. You take one of my boys, uh, uh, David or Peter Mike, one of those fellows got in bad trouble and killed a man and died in an electric chair. You know how he died in an electric chair? He died in an electric chair of my son. You say, why? He's born of my seed. You can't change it. If the guy changed his name, but you can't change the seed. You can't go back to your mother's womb and be born again a second time. Nicodemus had more sense than that. Folks, you Baptists believe once saved, always saved. You better rephrase that. We believe once born again, you can't be unborn again. That's what we mean. Now, the reason why you don't think that's true is because you have been born again. And these fellows talk about, you know, about uh, losing salvation. Jimmy Swagger, before he got in the trouble he's in, I don't mean to pick on uh, Brother Swagger, but I think the fellow's a saved man. Did a lot of foolish things, a lot of stupid things, got in out of trouble, and maybe deserved what he got, maybe not. But I'm not picking on him. I'm just saying before he got in the trouble he got into, he used to say these Baptists preach this damnable doctrine of eternal security. Well, it's a funny thing for a man to say who never lost it himself. <laughs> Isn't it strange these th folks think you can lose it, but they don't think they can lose it? Here's old Jimmy Baker and Swagger say, well, if I'm going to lose, these Baptist people are all saying, said a fellow can't lose salvation, you can lose it, you can lose it, you can lose it. And then between them, they commit adultery, fornication, fraud, embezzlement, perversion, and neither one of them lost it. Isn't that a strange thing? Now listen, if you're saved, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to go home to heaven when you die. You say, well, that's when I'm in terrible trouble right now, living like the devil, and life's all messed up, and I don't even know if I want to go to heaven. Tough apples, you'll have to go anyway. <laughs> The passage you've got there in 1 Corinthians 11, 30 says, For this cause many among you are weak, and many sickly, and some sleep. But we should judge ourselves. We should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chasing the Lord, that we should not be condemned of the world. Now you take a psalm, a son who's going to get whipped. God, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You don't go to hell when you sin. You get whipped when you sin. And when you go through God's spiking machine, you don't enjoy going through it again. And then the Lord can whip. The best way to do when you get whipped is getting as close as you can. That way you won't get such a bad beating. Listen, your sins are paid for judicially at Calvary. They're forgiven judicially at Calvary. But the judgment seat of Christ, you will see for the things done in the body, whether they're good or evil. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Turn to it, Second Corinthians chapter 5. And this passage here deals with the judgment against servants. This is a judgment of servants, Second Corinthians 5, 10. You'll be judged for servants. So works do enter. But works have nothing to do with salvation. Now, you've got to get this thing right. You want to go to heaven? Trust Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You want to live a happy life in fellowship with God? Confess your sins. You don't? Keep your mouth shut. You want rewards when you see Jesus Christ? Go to work. You don't want any rewards? Rewards sit down do nothing. You don't get to heaven by working. Listen, listen. You don't get to heaven by confessing your sins. You go to heaven by trusting Jesus Christ. And let's hope the Lord doesn't tarry. Let's hope he comes soon. And if he doesn't come soon, then you're going to die. And when you die, you're going to face what we call the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is not the judgment of nations. It's in Matthew chapter 25. And the judgment seat of Christ is not the white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20. At this place here, you're judged as a servant. You're not judged as a servant there, you're judged as a son. You're not judged there as a servant, you're judged for your sins. 
Send the judge there. Send the judge there. Servants of judge here. And this judgment here, you're judged for what you did for the Lord Jesus Christ after you were saved. Now, works have nothing to do with your salvation, but they have something to do with your rewards after you're saved. This judgment seat of Christ has five rewards, and I'm not going to preach about it tonight because this is another message in itself. But there are five crowns passed out the judgment seat of Christ as reward for servants. One of those is the crown of glory that fadeth not away, given to a faithful shepherd or pastor. One is the crown of righteousness for the child of God that loves the Lord's uh, appearing and looks for his coming. One is an incorruptible crown, in First Thessalonians chapter 2. Or first uh, Corinthians chapter nine to deal with a Christian who uh, runs the race and is temperate and moderate in his living. One of them is a crown of, of uh, rejoicing found in First uh, Thessalonians chapter two. That's a true one of the crown. One of them is a crown of life, and that's a crown promised to a Christian who endures temptation. He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them to love him. And these crowns are earned rewards. They have nothing to do with uh, with salvation. They have to do with service for God after salvation. I know how Christians talk. Christians say, well, I'll just be glad to get to heaven. I'm not bucking for rewards. I'm not ambitious. If I just get to heaven, that'll be enough for me. No, it won't. Now, when you get there, it won't. There's going to be some weeping at the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be some wailing at the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be some penitent Esau's at the judgment seat of Christ saying, Oh, Father, hast thou not a blessing for me also, oh, my Father? And the Bible said he saw a place to repent, and he sought it carefully with tears and couldn't find it. Now, listen, if you went home tonight, found your house burned to the ground, your wife burned to death, to death, all your children are burned to death, your dogs, your cats, your parakeet, or whatever, burned to death. If that happens, don't tell me. Don't tell me. You come around next night and say, hey, Ruckman, let's go down here to see if and have a little celebration. I say, why? You say, I made it. I got out. I made it. The rest of them got burned, but I made out. Isn't that something to celebrate about? I don't believe you do it. But you do it now, won't you? Uh-huh. You let the word go to hell and a mile a minute all around you. Well, they're going to hell. I'm out. And well, if somebody else will, you know. I'll be satisfied if I make it. No, you won't. No, you won't. You get up and wish to God you'd done something, try to get him saved. You're not going to say that, son of a break. That selfish way of looking at things, it won't hold up there. You'll be sorry you didn't do something. You'll be sorry you didn't try to get him out. Do something. You want a reward? Get to work. You said, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, then sit down on your southern hemisphere and waste your time. You want a reward? You want the Lord to pat you on the back and say, well, down why wouldn't you want his approbation? Why wouldn't you want his com uh, condemnation, uh, commendation? Why wouldn't you want it? him to slap you on the back? He loves you. And died for you. I mean, why wouldn't you desire his his approval? Hmm? Uh, you love me and died for me. Appreciate it, Lord. See you around. Is that the deal? Well, that's some deal. Isn't it? Out there, came down your life for me, got whipped to death for me, and nailed for me. Just appreciate it, Lord. See you around. Listen, some of you Christians here, you better get the thing in gear. Ain't got much time left. All right, this is the judgment seat of Christ. What's that for? That's a judgment for servants. You want to get it right? Get it right. Get it right. God knows 90% of the church members in America don't have any of it right. You don't get to heaven by works. You get rewarded for works. You don't get to heaven by confessing sin. You stay in fellowship with God by confessing sin. You're not saved by confession. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace through faith and the finished work of Jesus Christ. You want to go to heaven? Trust Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Trust something else. You want to stay in fellowship with God? Judge your sins every day and the best of your ability, put them away. You don't want to stay in fellowship with God? Keep your own shop and act like a fool. You want rewards? Go to work today in my vineyard. Son, go to work today in my vineyard. You don't reward, want rewards? Keep on sitting on yard. It's that simple. What is that? That's right in the body of the word of truth. But judgments are not the same. Now take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, this final judgment is for sinners. You say, we're all sinners. Yeah, but some sinners got out of it up here. Now, if you didn't get out of it up here, then you're going to show up down here. Now, Revelation chapter 20, you start there about verse 11. But about verse 11, you read about what they call the great white throne judgment. This is the final judgment of the unsaved dead. And this judgment is a judgment referred to by most people when they talk about a judgment. When most people talk about judgment, they're talking about the last judgment. And the last judgment of the unsaved dead. If a man will not take his judgment at Calvary, where Christ was made sin for him, then he has to pay for his own sins. Don't you understand that? If you will not let him pay for them, then you pay for them. In Revelation chapter 20, along about verse 11, he says, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it from whose face heaven earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. But I saw the dead, the small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And the dead were judged out of those things, written in the books, that man according to his works. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This was the second death. And the sea and the, or the sea gave the dead which were in it, and they were judged out of man. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and the sea delivered up the dead which was in it. And they were judged every man according to his works. And whoever was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, I'm not going to draw that picture here. Instead, I'm going to Matthew 22. And although Matthew 22 deals primarily with something else, so it's a great illustration of what's going to take place at the last judgment. Because in Matthew chapter 22, there's a fellow who has a chance to get into a wedding, in a wedding garment, and he sneaks in there without the wedding garment, and he gets thrown out. 
And it's a beautiful picture of a man uh, trying to get into heaven without Jesus Christ. So that's what I'm going to draw on this picture here. And I'm going to draw about here a king who made a marriage for his son. And then when he came to look at the guests, he found a man that had not on a wedding garment. And he said, friend, how came this guy without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the text says, he said, bind him in hand and foot and cast him out of darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And the passage in Matthew chapter 22, what you have here is a king making a wedding for his son. And that obviously is Jesus Christ. And they tell his servants to go on the highway and they invite folks to come in. And he says, tell them all things are ready. Uh, the marriage was ready before they were ready. And he said, all things are now ready. Come to the marriage. And they went out there, and the Bible says when they got out there and tried to get folks to come to marriage, they, with one consent, they began to make excuse. One fellow said, I just married a wife and can't come. The other fellow said, I've got a piece of ground, got to go look at it, which is crazy, which is crazy. Don't ever buy a piece of ground without looking at it. <laughs> don't, don't, ever, don't ever, he says, I've got a yoke of oxen, I've got to go prove them. Don't ever, don't ever do that. Don't, don't buy a yoke of oxen and go see if they can plow. If they can't plow, you've got no business buying them. That's, that's the kind of alibi folks use for rejecting Christ. Just stupid as that. Well, a picture just can't live it. Who asked you to live it? That's got to do with this. And this. Let's not have the right feeling. Who asked you to feel anything? You were told to trust. Well, I don't want to have too many hypocrites in the church. Every one of us should see just alibi, alibi, alibi. You get up here and start singing like this I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Not that bid me come to the old Lamb of God I come. You'll stand back every cool thing in this world, run through your head. Well, you're not ready. Well, when do you get ready? Wait until you fixed up with your wife. Where do you get that bill paid off? Well, you're still having trouble with drugs. Well, what if the people find you're going to go to hell? You're going to go to hell messing around. They went out there and said, come on, and they began without it, with one consent, the Bible says, began to make it cute. And then he said, when they came in, they said, uh, Master, they won't come. And he said, they won't come. And he said, no. And he said, listen, I'm having a marriage for my boy, and my boy's going to have some guests, one way or another. And if those folks uptown folks won't come, go out on the highway and hedges and the back alleys and compel them to come in, I want some guests at the marriage. And they went out there on the highway, the hedges and the alleys, went out there in the, in the drug rehabilitation houses and the prisons and the slammers and the jails, and they got them a crowd together. And when they came in there, he came in and saw if I didn't have on a wedding garment. He said, how come you haven't got on a wedding garment? And the fellow said, uh, how come you don't have a wedding garment? And the fellow said, uh, well, should I ask you one more time, how come you got here without a wedding garment? And the fellow said, the Bible said he was speechless. The Bible says in the Romans, the whole world become guilty and every mouth stopped. What you doing here without a wedding garment on? No answer. Why? Why? Because he could have got one. And it wouldn't have cost him nothing. Now, back in those days, when they went out there and had a wedding, the fellow go out there and the servant go out there and say, would you like to come to a wedding? The man said, yes. He said, okay, here's a wedding garment. It's fine linen. Why is it fine linen? Fine linen is the rights of saints. And he said, this here won't cost you nothing. All you got to do is put it on. That means this is somebody else's righteousness being given to you for nothing. And the king steps in there before that fellow and he says, uh, what's that fellow without a wedding garment on? How'd he get in here? He could have had it and didn't want it. That's a snuck through. So him out. But Lord, out! With that, I'm a, I'm a 30 seconds out. Get that thing out of here. Aren't people strange? The only thing in this life you all feel strange that don't walk. Isn't that the strangest thing? I guess there's one thing that shows the perversity of human character. I guess that's it. The course of nothing. thing. But I guess the one thing that shows the thing else is an attitude towards money. You know what you got in Pensacola tonight? You've got 25,000 people in Pensacola tonight buying these little numbers. Just right and left, hoping they'll cash in the $4 million or $6 million. It's costing them money, money, money to take a chance on something that all of them can't possibly get. And the same circle coming to a church like this, and they'll stand up and sing. Almost persuaded now to believe, almost persuaded Christ for the sea, sees now some soul to say, go, spirit, go thy way. Now, fellow, stand there on something that's free, that's worth more than $7 million, and turn the thing down. God puts out a piece in the sky that's going to last forever, invites you to sit down and eat bread in the kingdom of God, and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the spirit of both men made perfect, and meet the cherub and the seraphim and the angels and meet the Trinity, and live in New Jerusalem and live with Brian Moody and, and George Whitfield and John Knox and Billy Sunday forever and ever and ever, and no pain, no sorrow, no death, no tears, no crying, the whole thing free. Can you stand there and listen to what I'm saying? Ain't it weird? It's weird. In comes the fellow, how come it's there and not in here without a winning gun? And he was speechless. And the Lord said, take that fellow and bind him hand and foot and cast him out of darkness. But the Lord, I, I, was, I, I was ahead of the boy's house, and he goes, throw him out. But the, the, the Lord, I headed up the cerebral pul pul uh, uh, pulse before, and I headed up the United Drive, and I was the board of directors, out! But Lord, I, I never did come to the door, I never get him out of here! Get that filthy thing here, out! And out you go, butt off the rim of the universe, and down the lake of fire, and down the river. Now listen, if you want to, want to go to heaven, trust Jesus Christ. If you want to go to hell, trust anything else. What means as good as another? You want to have fellowship with the Lord? Keep your sins judged and confessed and turn from them as much as lies within you. You want the world? Go to work today in the business. You want to go to heaven and explain what a good fellow you were, what a fine fellow you were, and why you wouldn't accept Christ? There's your chance right there.
Me? Count me out. I'm not about to take that chance. I'll take the chances right here. All right, Father. 